kind of keeping his business going, or this group. Yeah. Remember, we had the problem here. And you see, we ran into this last night already. This fellow is making stuff with stuff that wears out. OK? Yeah. I think we're getting there. The, and, I, and I don't want to put in my lines immediately. The supplier of spades resembles the supplier of potatoes. OK? Now, at the moment, you can see somehow the arrows are simpler in the far corner. Yeah, don't you just have to repeat, again, the same thing you said last night, that, that this whole thing gets repeated ad infinitum. I mean, or that's a limit. I mean, OK. Yeah? I mean, he has to buy anvils or he whatever. He has to buy, yeah. He has they to buy. wear out. And so there's that whole thing. You have a consumer free, I guess, and who then yes. pays $25,000 um, to someone to build anvils, and then that 25 um, goes to someone who's a consumer who kicks it back into the yeah. system. Um, yeah, and many of you are happy with that? That this, this, this group is, is like this group. It's vulnerable to the problems of uh, breakdown. Maintenance is, is an issue. And you have to have 5%. Yeah? OK. But let's not rush this. Yeah? This supplier is of potatoes, right? Yeah. And that's those spades. This fellow is supplying spades. So um, the materials that are used to make this, the, um, the spades in this category can be used to produce the, the, um, the materials the materials that produce the spades. Like, um, so that somehow it can be um, one supplier that does more than one thing, like more than one. Because, um, you know, this one is definitely like using space to produce a consumable yes. good, but this one is something more like, a, um, you know, machinery or something that. The machine be, tool industry, yeah. Right. yeah. So it can be more like a multiple. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, a tricky question there of, if you like, self self supply. Okay, but I could I could put in another layer, as you say, with with these people. Like that definitely you need, say, uh, a machine tool that produces the the handle of the spade. Okay, so I could put in C3 up above, and the supplier of the machine tools. OK? And uh, you find that there's less and less money involved as you go up. But your problem, or, or your answer, comes in at some level, where the, the one unit is somehow making the machine tools for making its own stuff. Otherwise, you're going on and on and on indefinitely. OK? Yeah? OK, what I'm going to do then, and, and this is a device Lonergan follows through on, and I follow through on in my own book. In a later stage of economics, it may be relevant to subdivide uh, machine tool industries, OK? But the strategy that Lonergan uses, and it's, it's a current strategy vaguely present in neoclassical economics, is that you don't distinguish above this second level, OK? This man has machine tools, or this woman. 
where, did, where does she get the machine tools? She gets them from a supplier of machine tools. Where are you going to put that supplier in this diagram? You do something like you suggest. Let's assume that this is the community of suppliers of machine tools at any level. Okay? And at the top level, you have to have a way of somehow making machine tools without having to have machine tools that you haven't made yourself. That's fair enough. Uh, if you think of Robinson Crusoe, who was it mentioned Robinson Crusoe last night? Yeah. So he, he finds that he can kill fish with a, a pointed stick. Well, then he's got to get something to put a point on the stick. So he finds a, a, a hard stone. Well, now, if he can't get the hard stone, he has to get something else to make the stone sharp. Well, it'll be another stone. At some stage, he's got to sort of use what he's got on itself. Yeah? So it's not inconsistent to have only one arrow between S2 and C2, or even two arrows between C S1 and C1. Well, well we're not finished yet. No. OK. <laughs> but there's a sense in which, yes, I, uh, we're, we're pushing to put right. in another arrow. In the, in the same proportion? Like there, at 2500? Uh, who, was it you came up, or you came up with 2500? It's not a bad estimate, actually. It's 2361 dollars. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, in, in other words, let's, let's keep it very symmetrical. Just as this man needs to pay 5% to keep his business going. So there's this woman, OK? Now, notice how we divided it here. You have the, the million going that way. Oh, yeah, going that way. 950 plus 50. Now, we want to keep our 50 this way, or we ruin this wonderful economy. and, and We'll tackle those problems shortly. Still, these people need money for maintenance. Now, what, what, how will I handle that? 5%. OK, well, what I'm going to do is it's, He becomes it's, a C2. Doesn't he become? Yeah, he becomes a C2. He becomes somebody who's saying, I need to set aside 5% of my 50,000. So you go back to C2. Yeah, so there's a way in which this person has to become a C2, and it joins on to the 50,000. OK? Now, uh, keeping the, 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 the numbers consistent, requires how much money here? OK, look back here. You have 50,000 going for maintenance, which is 5% of a million. But the 50 to what's going to C1 is 1 to 19. OK? No problem there. OK? It's terrible sometimes people being held up by just mathematics. So that's 19 to 1, adding up to 2050s. OK, so let's say that we're leaving the 50,000 here. The money going to maintenance will be one nineteenth of fifty thousand. Okay. Now that shouldn't pull us up. In other words, of the total outlay of this business, nineteen twentieth goes to. 
bread and butter. And 120th goes to maintenance. OK, so the same thing is happening here on my supposition. That's 1920th, OK? And the other will be 120th. And it's a simple matter of division. Uh, divide 50,000 by 19. And you get anyone good at mental arithmetic? Something like 2361. Am I right? 19 into 50, uh, 38. Got 120 left over. 19 to 120. Or so six times. Yeah. And six over. 19 into 60 goes three times. And three over. 19 into 30 goes once and a little bit over. We forget about the fraction of a dollar. Now, is that OK? Sometimes you, you throw in a, a bit of numbers, and it confuses people on the principle, which is terrible. It, it's simply keeping this effort symmetrical. And I'll talk about the problems underlying that. OK, in other words, these people spend $50,000 on wages. Remember you mentioned materials, raw materials, etc. Yeah? That, 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 that you needed another arrow. Yet you need another arrow. In the sense that you need an arrow for materials, etc. But that's all built into the single arrow uh, that is pointing towards income from uh, the factories that make spades. But that income, as we will see gradually, may end up anywhere. The, uh, the person working for wages will probably spend the entire income on this week's goodies. The person with a very good salary may spend the entire salary every month, having a high old time. <clears throat> but we see that there is that question of savings, which we haven't dealt with. But the main point here is that the question of raw material is solved by this arrow. What's not solved is the question of maintenance, replacement. And that's what gives this arrow, which is 2631. Am I right? And that becomes 52631. How are we doing? It's not confusing, is it? It is, no? Uh, any light or darkness? Hey, the strange number simply comes from the fact that 1 19th of 50 is 2631. Yeah? Just explain to me again why it will pull back to us to Yeah. Uh, as Kerry says, that this person becomes a consumer, a C2. This person needs to replace machine tools. And that mental stance, uh, I have to put aside money to buy machine tools, is represented by this movement through functions. So that the function of some of the money received here is to make this person a consumer of another supplier, another supplier in, in that same group. Uh, all right. Okay. 
So I'm, I'm leaving out an extra layer. It, it looks like you just did what governments normally do in times of crisis in Europe, just printing money. Uh, how, how, how did, explain to me how we went from 50,000 from S1 to C2. We started off, I thought, sending the 50,000 from C2 to S2, and now suddenly, well, I understand the 119 up to there, it's yeah, fine, but then money. suddenly we got to 52631. How, where, where did that where did that maneuver come from? Well, out of my creative imagination. <laughs> <measures. laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's it's right on. Yeah. Uh, in other words, I'm trying to I have a great career in the treasury. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm trying to understand the static economy. Okay, right. and I was doing very nicely with this million per interval. So we got that far last night that, OK, you need $50,000 for maintenance of uh, spades, etc. OK, now, that whole addition this morning, last night it was just, OK, a vague problem. But we knew that but if you have to maintain a static economy, you have to have 50,000 coming in here. Mm -hmm. OK, and, and that's going to, there, there are a lot more problems here. So in order to have that 50,000 here, yeah, we, we actually add in to the money a sufficient amount that will guarantee that flow per interval. It's not a, these are not quantities of money in the economy. No. These are flows per interval. Okay. And how much money do you need to guarantee that flow? That's a very involved problem that is regularly not considered in modern economics. So I shouldn't get hung up on the numbers as such. No, but, but it, no, it's good to bring out the point that uh, on my initial model from Gordon, a million dollar economy is working very nicely. What we noted was that his diagram is just unreal, that you do have maintenance problems. Now you try and modify what he has in his, his book, and you, you can get as far as, OK, then the 50,000 is coming back here, and you still have a static economy. But the realism pushes you forward to admit that these have the same problems. And so I'm led to add in this extra flow that wasn't in the initial model. Does that make some sense? So that I end up with an economy that looks comfortably static. It reproduces itself period by period. And this is Schumpeter's chapter one, and it's, it's marvelously done. And that there are some elements in this that nobody has revisited. The, the question of zero interest rate and things like that. Uh, there's, a, there's another doctorate thesis, John. I'm trying to find a doctorate thesis from John Pine there. Uh, on Schumpeter's theory of interest. What is the nature of interest? in an exchange economy. And, and it's totally different from the stuff you get in Keynes or Hicks or the ISLM curve, that sort of stuff. Uh, Lonergan never worked this out fully. But I think the bits of it are, are in Schumpeter. I mentioned Schumpeter being an unfortunate economist. Uh, his first work was neglected. His great work was published in 1939 in two volumes, Business Cycles. And it was just the wrong time. Uh, Norman Hansen had said a year before in the American Economic Society that business cycle studies are now dead. And the reason for that was that Keynes had taken over to Hicks' 1937 paper, uh, which still dominates textbooks. Keynes, or Hicks simplified Keynes in the autumn of 36 and published it in 37. 
And, and anyone in economics knows that famous diagram that dominates first your textbook. Uh, balancing interest rate against money supply and that sort of stuff. Uh, so, so that's a zone that somebody can write a brilliant economic book on and get the Nobel Prize. Uh, okay, so that's chapter one of Shumpeja Bharat now. We have a static economy. It's working very sweetly in that you don't have oscillations of prices. Consumers, one, get a million dollars to spend. The replacement money measures up to enough to pay for that circulation and this crossover. Okay. Now, the, what we've got, having left Gordon, what we have got now is instead of one little diagram, it is a two-layered diagram. Okay? And the problem with the economists is that they don't like the two-layered diagram. Uh, out of this diagram, you will, instead of having national income, etc., you're going to have a Y2 and a Y1. These are the significant variables that we were searching for last night. Th there's a flow of money here related to what we normally call consumption goods. And the problem in a static economy is to not vary that flow in spite of the problem of maintenance. And that is solved by these, what are called crossovers, being equal. But I want to go back to the middle of last night when we talked about the spade, how much the spade was worth, and we, we eventually got to the notion that, okay, let's be real. In exchange terms, the spade is worth what you paid for it. What's the spade worth within the economy? Okay, now we, we got over the labor theory of value and various other viewpoints. If you have a spade that you're using to dig potatoes, uh, what's it worth? Two, two people can get together about the spade. One farmer is closing down his farm and he's selling his goods. And what it's worth is what he sells it for eventually, an actual exchange. And none of its economics does not deal with possible exchanges or expected exchanges. Okay? Still, you have a spade in the economy. And an economist, a neoclassical economist, can ask, well, I want an estimate of, of the worth of this spade. And the question is, of course, why? <laughs> Certainly the man who is, is going bankrupt wants an estimate of those closing up his business. But what is the significance of wanting an estimate of the value of the spade? in, that is operating in the economy. The significance of that struggle to estimate the value of the spade is the possibility of merging the two levels. You get rid of the second level. You get rid of an awful lot of difficulties in economics. Yeah? You have a lot of difficulties in estimating the national income, the gross domestic product. Uh, I, I doubt if 
anyone here can sense the massive difficulties associated with having two national incomes. Yeah? Uh, pause over that for a jiffy. It's, it's a very significant shift. This opens up the problem mar marvelously to think of the fact that, okay, you have a, a flow of income in the economy on, on Lamagan's analysis that is very definitely identifiable as having the function of maintaining machine tool manufacture. Okay? And, and uh, why, I'm, why I'm pushing this at the moment is because I'm foreseeing a regular economist's response to Lonergan's work that we don't have these surges anymore. Yeah? So I, I'm, I'm emphasizing that this is not a problem of economic surges. It comes out of that. And the whole problem of economics comes out of the innovation business. But the analysis is relevant to a static economy. Okay, so you have a flow of money down here, 950 a week. That is the flow that meets consumption goods. Okay? Fair enough? And you have a flow of money that meets the manufacture of, well, let's call them capital goods, okay? Is that fair enough at the moment? Yeah? But, but you can't use that loop in the lower thing for some reason. Yeah, now you see, the, the problem which is worth pausing over is if there was some way in which you could measure the spade in terms of potatoes, you might be able to dodge this analysis. Well, yeah. Because all the other levels are the same kind of machine tool category, they're, they're not edited, they're not, uh, they're not spuds that, that you can yeah. that loop. Oh, 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 okay, now uh, let's not get into the fact that, uh, that I'm, I'm squashing all the layers into one up here. Okay. But the problem I'm focusing on is that if you could identify the sale of the, the spade as a multiple of potatoes, then you could squash this down, okay? In other words, one spade is worth two years of harvesting potatoes, which works out to be uh, two tons of potatoes. Then you could push towards avoiding Lonergan's analysis. But there is no way of determining the value of the measuring capital in that way. That's the, the, the statement that I mentioned yesterday. And indeed, it, it's worth going back to John Robinson's little comment on that because it it's related to our effort here to break with our daft education. And, and the problem is not to sort of have a laugh at the first year economists, but to suspect that this happened to you. So uh, when we read this passage, you have to think of, well, is this happening to me in law, psychology, sociology? Mathematics. I, I brought in Frank's calculus. I wanted to comment on it in the afternoon. It's a big text on calculus. How many pages? I think they, they sort of they, they produce these by weight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a thousand pages. Wow. Uh, so uh, Robertson talks about the the education of economists. Uh, I, I mentioned it last night. The student is taught to write the equation zero is equal to this page 26, uh, Roman numerals, Joe. Uh, the student writes zero is equal to FLC. L is the quantity of labor. C is the quantity of capital. 
and always the rate of output. Uh, he's instructed about the laborers, he's instructed about the, the unit of output, and then he's hurried on to the next question in the hope that he will forget to ask in what units C is measured. Before ever he does ask, he has become a professor. And so sloppy habits of thought are handed on from one generation to the next. So and there is a massive literature on this. And it relates to the, the possibility of squashing these two. Now, I'm bringing out the fact that uh, there is no determinate way of getting rid of the second circuit. And there's a clear functional distinction. 